Welcome back to my Intro to x86 Assembly Language series. My name is Davey Wybro, and in this video, I'll cover program control flow in x86 Assembly. Unlike most languages, Assembly lacks the usual constructs for things like iteration, conditions, and function calls. Instead, the programmer has to build this kind of behavior using jump instructions. But first, I'd like to introduce something called the instruction pointer. This is an internal pointer in the processor, often labeled as EIP. As your program runs, instruction after instruction, this pointer holds the location for your machine code that the processor is executing. This means that the processor can jump around to different locations in the code by simply altering this pointer. But unlike a register, you can't change the instruction pointer by using the normal move, add, subtract operations. Instead, the instruction pointer is changed by using jump operations. So let's take a look at one of these jump one of these jump instructions. First, we'll do the usual setup and define an entry point. Then we'll move 42 into EBX and 1 into EAX. Now here's the interesting part. This JMP mnemonic is for the jump operation. The operand I'm giving it, skip, is a label that I'll define here shortly, and the result of this operation is that the instruction pointer is moved to the location of this skip label. This next instruction is just a sort of proof that the jump is working. If the jump does work, then this move instruction won't be executed and EBX will remain as 42 instead of being changed to 13. This is the code that's being skipped over with the jump. Now we can define that skip label. Uh, just like the start label, uh, this is a way of naming a specific location in the code. Anytime you end an identifier with a colon like this, uh, in NASM you're telling it to create a label. And finally, we perform the interrupt to exit the program. Now, if we open up a terminal and do the usual assemble, link, execute steps, and then do echo dollar sign question mark to inspect the exit status, the result will be 42, which means that our program, uh, that our jump instruction caused the processor to jump over that line that moves 13 into EBX. This is called an unconditional jump, but what if we wanted to jump? Uh, what if we wanted the jump to depend on a particular condition being true or false? If we could do that, then we could implement conditional branching by jumping forward over code, or we could implement looping by jumping backwards over code. So let's make this a uh, condition branch based on a less than comparison. First. I'm going to use the ECX register to perform the test on, and I'm setting it to 99 as an example value. Now I'm adding another instruction with the mnemonic CMP, which stands for compare. This instruction doesn't jump anywhere and doesn't seem like it has any actual effect, except it sets these flags in the background based on this comparison. So there are special bits are being set elsewhere in the processor that we can check on afterwards to ask what the comparison results are. And by this I mean that we can check if ECX was less than, greater than, or equal to the right hand operand, which is 100 in this case. Now I'm changing that JMP operation to a JL operation. This means jump if less than. The jump will only happen if the previous comparison had a less than result. Otherwise, it'll move right down to the next line and keep executing as though the jump instruction weren't there. But since we set ECX to be 99, and the comparison is checking if uh, ECX is less than 100, it will jump right over the assignment of 13 to EBX, which means our program will have an exit status of 42. But what happens when we change the value of ECX to be greater than or equal to 100? 
Well, the condition is no longer true, so the jump instruction is ignored and EBX is set to 13. So now our exit status is 13. Pretty cool, right? Here are some of the common conditional jumps we can make in addition to the JL instruction. There are a few others, but they're more for dealing with special cases, so I'm glossing over those for now. So let's go ahead and build a loop using these jump instructions. To show that it works, this loop will compute 2 to the ECX power by looping ECX number of times and doubling another register each iteration. So here's the standard entry point setup. And I'm going to keep the result in EBX since that's the register that will end up being the exit status for the program. By the way, don't ever use the exit status for returning a useful result like I've been doing in this series. Um, I'm only doing that because it's the easiest way to show you that these programs are actually generating a correct result. But you should be returning zero in the exit status unless there was an error and you can output any actual results to standard out or something. Anyway, I'm storing the iteration count in ECX, so right now, with it set to 4, we'll be computing 2 to the 4th power because it'll be doubling EBX, uh, which starts at 1, 4 times. And here's the start of the loop. It's just a label that I've creatively named label. Uh, this allows us to jump back to this point here in a while. The first thing I'm doing inside the loop is doubling EBX by adding it to itself. Now here's a new instruction for you. DEC is the mnemonic for decrement, which means uh, to subtract one from. You could do this as a subtract operation, but decrement is more efficient. There's also an I in C if you wanted to increment a register or add one to it. Now I'm comparing ECX with zero. Then we can do a conditional jump. So if that previous compare was greater than, meaning that ECX is greater than zero, then this jump will move the instruction pointer back to label. And since ECX is being uh, decremented each iteration, it'll eventually reach zero and the loop won't, the jump won't happen, so the loop will end. Finally, I'll set EAX to 1 so we can make a system exit call and then perform the interrupt in the program. And now we can build and execute the program like we've done in previous examples. And the result is 16 because 2 to the 4th power is 16. If we change that 4 to a 6, we get 64 because 2 to the 6th power is 64. So that's it for this video. We're almost to the point of implementing functions, but in order to do that, we have to learn more about the stack first. So that's what I'll cover in the next video. But until then, bye.